Welcome to the Man Cave Podcast with Dan Casper. What up, everybody? Welcome to this episode of the Man Cave Podcast, brought to you by our good friends from High V and Toys and Ford. And don't forget to check out the Sway Cave, the resonance branding company Sway Cave. That link is in the podcast description, the official swag provider for the Man Cave Podcast. Dan Casper here. Uh, we're going to talk some brewers, Willie Adamas, Jackson Cheerio, coming up in the second half of this episode of the podcast. Because the first half, where I want to lead things off, it's game week. We got uh, Packers kicking off their season Friday night against the Philadelphia Eagles in Brazil. So Packers, they're they're healthy. I mean, everybody's practicing right now. And obviously we know this season is full of high expectations and full goals. I mean, the bullseye is on this team. The Packers can't surprise anybody like they did last year. So with that, and, and this was an off season of some change too, right? I mean, you had uh you had the you know new defensive coordinator coming in, new defense coming in, uh Xavier McKinney, high priced uh, safety coming in here. Jordan Love got a brand new contract there too. Josh Jacobs, a new running back, is in the fold. So definitely a season of changing here. But uh, even with the changes, the expectations have grown. Uh, have grown. Packers are uh, the youngest team in the league, but that that's no excuses. There's there's championship expectations from fans, from the players, from the coach staff, and the organization overall. So with that, who are the five most important Packers people for this season, for this season to be a successful season, for this season to end in a championship? I say people because I'm putting coaches with this. Okay, I'm putting coaches in this in this equation as well. So it's not just players, but players and coaches. I've got my top five. It might be the same as some of you. It might have a couple of the same people as you. It might be completely different. And the thing is, I think we could probably expand it to a top ten, top fifteen, right? I mean, there's there's a lot. It's all hands on deck. I mean, that's why they say football is the ultimate team game. But I'm going to narrow it down to just five, and this is just in my opinion. So, and in no particular order, uh, no particular, I'm not going to rank them like this is the main guy or, or this is the fifth main guy on, on this thing. So I'm just going to go through it. Number one, again, not really ranked, but my first, I should say my first pick, I'm going to, I'm going to go out there is Jordan Love. And I think that's an obvious reasons. I mean, it's a quarterback driven league. Okay. It's quarterback driven league. You need some solid, you need some really good quarterback play to get to where you want to be. And Jordan Love Last year, didn't really know what to expect up and down to, to kind of begin the season, then played like the best quarterback in the entire league in the last month or so, is now being paid as the top quarterback in the league. So we got film on him. Defensive coordinators know a little bit more about him. Can Jordan Love play to that level that we saw at the end of last year? Can he pick back up where that was at or maybe even take it up another level? What's in store for year two of the Jordan Love starting experience? This team will go as far as Jordan Love can lead them. If he's going to play at an upper echelon quarterback level, as a top quarterback, this team has a shot to win a championship, to win multiple championships. But if for some reason his play goes down, this team's in a lot of hurt. A lot of hurt. So easily, number one. If we were to rank him, he's probably my number one. Jordan Love. Okay. Uh, next on my list, I'm going to go with somebody that's going to help him out in the backfield. That's Josh Jacobs. A changing of the guard at the at the running back position. Aaron Jones gone. Josh Jacobs in. I think you're going to see more of a bell cow type of back with Josh Jacobs, but also a guy that's going to be involved in the passing game. And maybe 400 total touches, you know, between rushing and, and catching the ball. That's a lot. Uh, you know, when when you think about that, three hundred somewhere around there. I mean, you know, four hundred might be might be asking old. <laughs> I mean, you're talking about, yeah, that uh, maybe I don't know. Well, where where should that line be? I, I the thing is, Josh Jacobs is going to be utilized a lot, both in running and both in passing. And I think you know, when you look at the depth of the running back position too, with no AJ Dillon, Josh Jacobs is going to be asked. Even for a little bit more, he's going to be utilized a little bit more. He's going to be your three down back. Okay, 
involved in, in running, involved in passing. If they can get Josh Jacobs going to where he is a threat, where he is a threat every time he touches the ball, especially handing it off, that opens up so much more, so much more for Jordan Love in the passing game. I mean, I don't think there's a coincidence. When you look at last year when Aaron Jones was healthy and and he was running the ball really well, getting over 100 yards, look at how the passing offense was performing too. It opened up things in the passing game. Okay, That wasn't an accident. That wasn't just by coincidence. It's because the running game helped open up the passing game too. So Josh Jacobs has a chance to be a huge, huge uh, part of this offense and, and leading this offense to one of the best offenses in the entire league. And then with that, I'm going to go with Matt LaFleur. Matt LaFleur as a head coach, but also as the offensive play caller. Okay? A little bit more familiar now with his young receivers, more familiar with his quarterback. You got this new running back in. As an offensive play caller, I'm looking at the roster of this team and I'm like, kind of like an evil scientist, what can I do here? I've got options all across the board. And I thought Matt LaFleur last year, towards the playoffs, into the playoffs, was always like a step ahead of the opposing defensive play callers. Can he continue to do that this season? Can he continue to do that throughout the season and into the postseason, hopefully towards a championship? Staying one step ahead of the opposing defensive play callers. That's where Matt LaFleur has to be. This is, I think, a a chance for Matt LaFleur to really establish himself, if there was any doubters out there, as one of the premier offensive play callers, head coaches in the game. Last year was a big year for him. No Aaron Rodgers, can't use that excuse. Okay, he's got a new young quarterback. This will really showcase what kind of play caller he is. And he did a really good job towards the end. After he kind of let it loose, and he even admitted to that, you know, beginning parts, maybe a little bit unknown, got a little bit more comfortable. This is a really big shot or a really big chance for, for Matt LaFleur, I think, to really establish himself as a top-tier play caller and head coach. Then on the defensive side, the defensive coordinator, new defensive coordinator, Jeff Hayfley coming in. Honeymoon's over. Okay, all the positive talk all offseason from players to, to fans. And everybody's excited. Jeff Hayfley saying all the right stuff that we want to hear. Now let's see it on the field. Let's see it in the games. I'm I'm one of those believers if Jeff Hayfley turns this unit into a top five unit or or a really good unit, he's not going to be around much longer. He's going to get some head coaching looks. Okay. I, I, I really believe that. The thing is this team has talent on the defensive side. It's just he's got to be the the chef now, putting these guys in the right position for the best recipe for success. And I and and enough talk. It's it's time to see the proof on the field. Can he get this defense to play at a top five, top ten level? Can they get after the quarterback? Can they get off the field on third downs? Can they stop the run? Can they force turnovers? Everything that we heard, are we going to see it come to fruition on the field during the games? And then defensively, I think you could pick a few different players here. I went, you know, you could go with Rashawn Gary, Jair Alexander, Xavier McKinney, and I wouldn't argue with those. Quay Walker, I think. Deserves to be in here, too. He'd be in my next five for sure. But I'm going to go with Kenny Clark because I think with this defense, you know, obviously Jeff Hayfley's talked a lot about, about secondary press coverage, and, and he's a secondary coach by trade. But he's talked a lot about the defensive line and how, you know, they're going to be aggressive at the defensive line, getting after the quarterback. And I feel like Kenny Clark has been an underrated defensive tackle for many years because of what he was asked to do within a, a particular style of defense. Eating up some blocks, you know, trying to create some room for some linebackers. He's always been double teamed. He's been the focus. I think he's going to have more opportunities this year playing in a 4-3 and playing within this style of defense. I think he's going to have an opportunity to make more plays, and I think he's going to have an opportunity where more people are going to know who Kenny Clark is and, and being one of those defensive or dominant defensive tackles in the game. And I think for this defense to take that next step, to being a top-tier defense, it has to start up front in the trenches. And then that guy is Kenny Clark. So those are my five. But again, you can make the case for a few other people out there. Who do you got? All right? Hit me up. Hit me up on Twitter or shoot me a message on Facebook. All right, let's take a quick break here. 
regroup. We're going to switch our focus uh, a little bit to baseball. Willie Domus is hot, man. Jackson Cheerios hot, man. Brewers are rolling right now, and we got less than a month of the regular season to go here. So let's take a quick break, and we're going to talk some baseball after these quick words. Get ready for football season with High V. Whether you're tailgating at the game or having a party at your home, High V has all the essentials you need for game day. From meats to put on the grills to snacks and beverages, including their huge wine and spirits department, High V is your tailgating headquarters. And don't forget to check out their sports shop too, where you can get some swag to help cheer on your favorite team, including the local high schools. It's football season. Score a touchdown with all of your football needs with High V in Eau Claire. We're getting set for another busy travel. With the Lucky Land Slots, you can get lucky just about anywhere. This is your captain speaking. Uh, we've got clear runway and the weather's fine, but we're just going to circle up here a while and uh, get lucky. No, no, nothing like that. It's just these cash prizes add up quick. So I suggest you sit back, keep your tray table upright, and start getting lucky. Play for free at LuckyLandSlots.com. Are you feeling lucky? No purchase necessary. VGW Group. Void were prohibited by law. 18 plus. Terms and conditions apply. Season, vacations, taking our kids to all their games and activities, and you need a proper vehicle to get you to where you're going and safely. That's where Toys and Ford can help you. Toys and Ford will go the extra mile to provide you with compelling options for new and used car shopping. They will gladly work with you on financing no matter what your budget may be. They're committed to giving drivers across the Chippewa Valley the best in customer service. Check them out for yourself. Visit Toys and Ford in Chippewa Falls today and check out their website, toysandford.net. Talk it's a Brewers. Brew crew. After taking three out of four against the Reds, starting past this past Friday, getting the doubleheader, getting a win on Saturday, falling just short on a walk-off on Sunday, uh, began a series yesterday against the Cardinals and the Brewers, powering their way to a 9-3 to victory. Uh, Freddie Peralta went five and a third, giving up six hits, three earned, run- three earned runs, a couple of dingers on there too. But uh, after that, bullpen locked it down, even though Hudson looked uh, a little, I don't want to say struggled, but the pitch count a little bit there in the first his first inning of uh, relief there. But nonetheless, him and Ross shutting it down, uh, taking over for Peralta. But when you've got uh, nine runs there, you can throw out a couple relievers who can give you a couple innings out there too. So and that's exactly what happened with the Brewers yesterday. Willie Adamas, I mean... Dude is let's let's hope this is this is something that could continue once we get to the postseason, right? What he's doing at the plate right now. Let's let's hope that this could continue. Because this dude, his price tag's going up and up and up. Um I didn't know if the Brewers were gonna be able to afford him a few weeks ago and uh now I really don't know if they're gonna be able to afford him. I mean, you wanna talk about a run that he's on. Uh Entering his contract, your final month of the regular season, five straight games with a homer, uh, tied for the most third, uh, tied for the most three run home runs in a season thirteen, with Ken Griffey Jr. and his line right now twenty nine home runs, ninety nine RBIs, an OPS of an eight twelve, which is higher than his career uh, averages of a seven sixty eight. His on base percentage is a three thirty eight higher. Than his career average of a 323. Uh, his batting average right now is 255, higher than his career average of 249. In his last 30 games, Willie Adamas is hitting 283 with an on base of a 362, slugging 628, and 12 home runs and 28 RBIs. I mean, the man is hot at the plate right now hot at the plate i mean at the beginning of the season it was kind of a you know bases loaded situation for the brewers and it was like maybe you should bet the money that they are going to get a grand slam now it's when you know you got two on and willie adamas is up the plate it's like oh <laughs> you feel maybe pretty good that you're going to get a three-run shot there for, from willie adamas but the man has been on fire right now and has been a big boost to this Brewers offense as of late here. Hopefully, this is something that can continue as we get into the postseason here. Hopefully, he can continue to stay hot. We're going to need it when we get to that postseason. We're going to need it for a long playoff stretch there. Willie Adamas staying hot at the plate. 
Uh, speaking of staying hot at the plate, Jackson Cheerio, man. I mean, <laughs> this kid is riding confidence. Call Apparently he called a shot yesterday. Yeah, you know, before the guys are on, you know, before the guys are on base. Apparently he called a shot. It was going to be a grand slam. Goes out there and does it. Uh, you know, and, and I love it too because he's having a very successful season. So you're starting to hear more stories come out about him. And, you know, more interviews are obviously done with him and, and reporters are asking questions to his teammates about him and such. And and the teammates always talk about, you know, he just oozes confidence. Like you go up to Freddie Peralta and just kind of have fun and say, see how good I am in that. And I was reading a little bit from, I think it was Kurt Hogg from the, the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel, talking about, you know, rookie with a lot of confidence, maybe giving some flashbacks to a Ryan Braun who came in as a rookie with a ton of confidence too. But, I mean... <laughs> When you're playing this well, how do you not have all the confidence in the world? And again, I've, I know I've said this a few times when it's come to Jackson Cheerio. I don't see him too often where he doesn't have a smile, even when he's rounding the bases. After his grand slam yesterday, dude's just got this big grin on his face going around. The kid is having fun. The thing is, remember, he's a kid. He's 20 years old. He's 20 freaking years old. He doesn't know any better right now. And he's just having, he's balling out there. He's having fun and obviously making a lot of money doing so too. But, I mean, really, when you break this down and you look at his stretch, going back, I don't know if we realize how good he has been since the month of June, for crying out loud. Okay? You look at his June numbers. Let's just break it down month by month to, to give you a little bit of a perspective and how how awesome he has been at the plate. June, he hit 315. Okay, these are just June numbers. June, he hit 315. It's like that's when things really started to click for him. His on-base percentage was a 363 slugged 534. That's just June. You look at his July numbers. 317 batting average, 364 on base, slugged 512. August, he improved it again. 321 batting average, 372 on base, 554 slugging. I mean, you know, just in terms of of batting average, he's kind of upticked it a little bit more every month. Obviously, just a couple games here to go in September, but, I mean, he's kind of falling down here. He's only hit 286 so far in September, so it's like, come on, dude. But he's slugging 714 in two games in September. I mean, this kid, it's, it's amazing. Take it in, Brewers fans, too. I mean, I know he's setting the bar incredibly high in his rookie season. And, you know, in his, his the rest of his career, especially next year and, and the next couple of years, we're going to be comparing it to how he looked in his rookie year. So he is setting the bar incredibly high. Where us in Wisconsin, we're, we, we've seen a few athletes – who have set the bar so incredibly high that when maybe they don't play up to that level or they play a little bit down, which is still great play, you're like, what the heck is wrong with that guy? Aaron Rodgers was a big one, right? Aaron Rodgers would always just set that bar so incredibly high. Like if he was off a little bit, it's like, oh, dude, what's wrong with Aaron Rodgers? Not saying Jackson Cheerio is going to beat to that level. It's still early in his career. That'd be awesome if he could get to that level. But (laughs) this kid... Um, I thought, you know, if we go back to our preseason predictions, maybe a 230 batting average to, to finish off a lot of highs and lows, and a lot of ups and downs. And, and that's how it kind of started for, for Jackson Cheerio to, to begin his career. But tip of the cap to him, man. Tip of the cap to, to this kid. What he's been doing is just incredible. And what he's been doing, especially since the month of June. We've talked about, you know, it was like June maybe for some rookies on this team to, to really kick it off. Tobias Myers, we've talked about him, you know, his his ERA and how he's looked since the month of June. One of the best pitchers in Major League Baseball since the month of June. Jackson Cheerio is easily one of the best players in all of Major League Baseball since the month of June. I mean, this team is... This team is rolling right now. Got to be feeling pretty good right now where, where things are at. Taking three out of four against uh, the Reds. 
taking this one against St. Louis. You're tied for the second most wins in all of Major League Baseball right now. The only team that's higher than you in wins is the Dodgers. And that's by two games. You're tied with Philly, who you're battling it out right now for for a top two seat. And right now, the top three teams in the National League, they're playing some really good baseball. And that's why the Brewers haven't been able to make up a lot of ground on them. It's always kind of hovered one and a half, two back from, from the top spot there. Because the Dodgers are 7-3 and three in their last 10. Phillies 7-3 and three in their last 10. Brewers are 7-3 and three in their last 10. I mean, the top three teams in the National League in this final month of the regular season here, they're playing good baseball right now. They're playing some good baseball. Another team, too, you got to... Just saying, good thing that uh, they've got a nice lead, but Cubbies are playing some good baseball too. They're 8-2 in their last 10 games right now. But other than that, you look at you know the last 10-game stretch, or these last 10 games and these 10-game stretch, you got the Mets who are 7-3, and three, uh, and then just, uh, just one team in the American League who's up there in terms of records in their last 10 games, and that's the Tigers who are 7-3 and three in their last 10 games. And this is going to be a, I think a, a, this is going to be a fun race to to the finish between these top three teams in the National League. I mean, when you look at this final month, these final few weeks here, you know, we know the Brewers' schedule, right? Cardinals for a couple games, Colorado, win those games, got to win those games, got to take care of your business, right? Take care of your business and win these games against teams like the Cardinals. And, and the Rockies coming up here. Get a little tougher after that. You've got San Francisco for three games. You just got done with them at three at home, but you're going to be on the road. And then that stretch, not to overlook that three-game against uh, series against San Francisco, but you got Arizona for three on the road, then you're back at home against Philadelphia starting on the 16th. Man. Whew. And then right after that, oh, by the way, four games against Arizona. So that stretch from like the 13th all the way to the 22nd, that could tell us a lot where the standings or how the standings are going to look entering that final week of the regular season for, for Major League Baseball. It is a huge couple weeks there for the Brewers coming up here uh, starting next weekend. But when you're looking at the upcoming schedule here too, if we're kind of doing you know scoreboard watching here a little bit, we're like, okay, what's what's the Dodgers schedule look like? What is What's Philly's schedule look like compared to to the Brewers here? Well, Dodgers got two quick games against the Angels starting uh, starting today, but then they're home against the Guardians, home against the Cubs. We just said Cubs playing really good baseball, eight and two in their last ten. Maybe maybe one of the better teams in baseball. I should say hottest teams in baseball as of late. Then they're on the road with four games against Atlanta. Marlins, Rockies, throw the Padres in there, then the Rockies to to finish up the season. Philadelphia, meanwhile, they've got two games on the road against the Blue Jays, then they're on the road against the Marlins, then Tampa Bay, then the Mets, who are fighting for a wild card spot. Then you got those three games against the Brewers, Mets for four, Cubs. We'll see if the Cubs at that point Maybe maybe trying to get it to a wild card spot, and then they finish up against Washington. I don't know. It's, there's not really. I don't think there's a schedule that just screams like, "Oh, that is way harder than everybody else," or, "Or that is so much easier than somebody else." I, I, especially when it comes to baseball, I just I, I don't know. But that's kind of where things are at. Kind of, I'm at that point now where I'm doing a little scoreboard watching. All right, did Philly win that game? Did they lose that game? What about the Dodgers? Where how, what are they doing in that game? This is going to be an awesome, I mean, just from a pure baseball sense, what a race to the finish here coming up here. And then you got, you know, we mentioned the Mets are just a half game out from a wild card spot. They're 7-3 in their last 10, but they've won five in a row. And they're chasing their division rival, the Braves, right now. Cubbies three and a half back. So lots to play for yet in the National League. The American League is still... 
I, I feel like we've got our teams, but you're still kind of competing for maybe some divisions here because, you know, Yankees and Baltimore, right now the Yankees are holding on by the slimmest of margins to that division. Cleveland back in the driver's seats for their division after the Kansas City Royals have lost their last six in a row. Houston's leading their division, then Baltimore, Minnesota, Kansas City. But then you got Boston, who's the next closest team, and they're four and a half out. Uh, but back to the Brewers here. Joe Ross yesterday came in for relief, closed out the game, finished off the game, two innings. Uh, two innings of work here. It sure seems like moving Joe Ross to to the bullpen here has been a a move that not only benefited the Brewers, but I think has benefited Joe Ross. Joe Ross began the season. We all remember signing in the offseason. like, oh, okay, that's a typical Brewer move, hoping to maybe get something out of nothing here that's viewed as a, as kind of a nothing. You know, not a big signing by any means, maybe a little bit of a reclamation project. And ups and downs, maybe a little bit more downs as of late. But ever since his move to the bullpen, Joe Ross has... Kind of been a different pitcher. He has allowed since August 6th, so we're talking, and it's only eight games here, but he's pitched in uh, 15 total innings. He's allowed one earned run, and that one earned run came in his second game on August 11th where he actually pitched three innings. One hit, one earned run, a couple walks on there. Other than that, nothing. This is his lines. August 6th, two innings, one hit, one strikeout, no earned runs. Three innings, one hit, one earned run, couple walks, three strikeouts. One inning, one hit. Two innings, two hits, no runs. One inning, one hit. Two innings, one hit. Two innings, one hit, all three Ks. And then yesterday, two innings, no hits, four Ks. Brewers... You know, once they get, and it sounds like, you know, Nick Mears is going to be coming back. You know, Kobe Milner is going to be coming back here. You look at now with the bullpen, you look at Aaron Ashby, who's putting up 99 miles per hour on the radar gun here. And then you got D.L. Hall, who had a fantastic start the other day. Now, all of a sudden, the Brewers pitching, whether it's starters or bullpen, you're in a situation now where you've got some tough decisions when you get to to playoff rosters and assuming everybody's healthy at that point. I mean, Joe Ross has transitioned very nicely into the bullpen. You bring in Aaron Ashby as a bullpen option now. You you look at what D.L. Hall just did. Mears is going to be coming back. Is he a part of that equation? Obi Milner. We know Devin Williams, Trevor McGill's back. I mean, now... What was kind of a weakness because of injuries throughout the majority part of the season, it's trending to where Brewers got a ton of options. Really, when you look at it, I mean, whether it's a starter or whether it's bullpen, they're going to have some options. They're really going to have some options. And depending on how things shake out when they clinch and where they're at, I mean, I'm hoping they're still competing for a top two spot. But depending on how everything shakes out, might have some guys that have plenty of rest here, too, heading into this postseason. I mean, this has been this has been a fantastic, fantastic uh, run right now for, for the Brewers. So. All right, hey, that's going to do it for us on this episode of the Man Cave Podcast, brought to you by our good friends from Hy-V and Toyson Ford. Until next time, I'm Dan Casper, and I will talk to you on the next episode of the Man Cave Podcast.